Chapter 15, 1978. Doctor Who. My agent, Irene Dawkins, had a jolly chum by the name of George Spenton Foster, who I'd met on a number of occasions. He was an ageing film and TV director and was, to boot, a very warm, witty and clever man. I adored him. On my return from the Canaries, I had a call from Irene to inform me that George was to direct the four-part story that would begin the next series of Doctor Who and was casting the part of the new companion, Romana. Would I be interested? My first thought was to say no. I was not a great sci-fi fan and had not watched Who for years. More pertinently, I only had a vague idea as to the role of the assistant, which, as I recalled, was a subsidiary one to the doctors and involved a lot of frightened screaming and question-asking. I decided it was not for me, having played much juicier parts hitherto, thereby deeming the part of companion beneath me. I had, of course, seen the inception of the series with William Hartnell playing the lead role way back in 1963 and remember vividly the excited discussion at school on Monday morning about this new and innovative TV show, it was like nothing anybody had ever seen before. Every Saturday from then on, I would gather with friends at our respective homes, alternating houses from week to week, and settle down at tea time to view the latest episode from whichever sofa we were on. Irene was disappointed at my reaction, which was lukewarm to say the least, and rang off. A couple of days later she called again, to suggest I should reconsider in the light of new information. Not only was the new assistant on a par with the Doctor in terms of intelligence, but she was also a time lady, which was a first, and a completely different kettle of fish from her run-of-the-mill antecedents. Also, it was mooted that she would not be a mere appendage, but a sidekick. This was before the times of strong women's screen roles. The feminist movement was in its infancy, and the major decision-makers in the visual media were almost exclusively male. The late and great Verity Lambert, the first producer of Doctor Who, had of course had a huge input into the show, but she was the exception that proved the rule. I told Irene that this time I would mull it over, and picked up the phone again to speak to my old rada pal Louise Jameson about it. She was the present assistant, and had of course had enormous success with her portrayal of Leela, the savage warrior woman. I had reservations for this reason too. Would anyone be able to follow such a popular act? Louise and I chatted for some time about my dilemma, and although she told me her time on Who had not been all sweetness and light, she exhorted me to go for the part. I called Irene a couple of days later and told her to go ahead and arrange a casting. Unbeknownst to me, and prior to my tootling along to the Beeb for my meeting, Graham Williams, the producer, and George had already seen about 600 girls for the part of Romana and had whittled the numbers down to just six who were now to be screen-tested. I went along, therefore, quite late in the day, and as is always the case with parts that one is not absolutely mad about getting, with a totally laid-back attitude and also with a touch of I'm too good for this, thrown in. <sighs> the arrogance of youth. I positively cringe to think about it now. I swanned in, not aware that the impression I created was exactly what they were looking for in the character, who was a bit upper self, and was told later that Graham and George decided on me in about two minutes flat. However, the screen tests had been arranged and were to be the next day. It was, after all, extremely important to see how the chemistry of all the actresses up for the part worked with Tom's. Most unusually, he was to act alongside us for all the tests. Most leading men would not consider lowering themselves to this task. Of course, once I began to play the role, I was actually extremely nervous to be part of this historic show, and any doubts I might have had about my status in regard to it were dissipated. However, I did try and recapture a vestige of the arrogance I'd casually and somewhat ignorantly assumed before, encouraged largely by Graham, who told me it was just what the part called for. George rang me up the night before the screen test. He was really rooting for me to get the part and told me to try and do something really bold to mark me out from the other girls. 
His suggestion was that as I was saying a particular line, I should casually saunter over to Tom, wind my arms round his neck and sit on his knee. After we'd said our goodbyes, I put the phone down and considered his idea. I looked at the script I'd been given for the next day and could not see how the lines tallied in any way with the actions George had mooted. Could I make it work? And more importantly, would I have the nerve to carry it off? I decided to sleep on it. I arrived at the BBC the next day and met Tom, who was in a good humour, genial, gallant and jolly. So far, so good. We started the scene, and when we got to the part where George had suggested the cheeky moves, I simply carried on without approaching my leading man in any way, feeling simply too nervy to make any improvised changes. When I told Tom about it weeks later, he roared with laughter and told me I should have gone for it. Poor George was not too amused, however, and asked me afterwards why I'd not opted for his idea. Luckily, I didn't have to answer as Graham Williams, the producer, came up to thank me for my contribution, telling me in time-honoured tradition that he would let me know. I travelled home in my little mini and reflected on the fact that I'd probably blown it as my director didn't seem too happy with my performance. Ah, well, I thought to myself, I didn't really want the part anyway, but I was lying to myself, as deep down I knew only too well that by now... I wanted the part very much indeed. I had a sleepless night, mentally going over and over the scene I'd done with Tom and realising all the mistakes I'd made. I felt surer than ever that the audition had been a write-off. I was wrong, however, as the next day Irene rang me to tell me that I was the unanimous choice for Romana. There must have been twenty journalists and photographers crammed into my tiny sitting-cum-dining room. Graham Williams was there too, desperately trying to control them all, and did an admirable job under the circumstances as they all milled around, snapping and quacking like so many ducks. I felt a mad impulse to give way to a bout of hysterical laughter and to deflect this decided to offer the champagne around. I was photographed with a glass in my hand, looking inanely happy, an image which appeared in every national and local newspaper the following day.